Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here. Time for the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion, the long version of what I talk about each morning with the What's Up in the Tropics series. Proud to say I've been doing that every day since June 1st. Haven't missed a single morning. I've always got it in before noon, so that's a good thing. With as busy as my life is, traveling a lot, family vacations, I'm able to squeeze it in because it's only a few minutes long, so it's easy to do. And I can just put graphics together and I don't have to worry about my presentation and whatever. Anyway, good to have uh, you on your side of the screen. It's good to be here on my side talking to you. So let's get on with it. It is the 18th of July. We're moving through the month. The Atlantic stays quiet for now. We know that's going to change. A month from now, it will have already changed. I can almost guarantee it. But for now, nice and quiet. So let's start real quick here with this tweet from the weather boy. Um, he lives out in Hawaii. I've met this uh, gentleman at the National Tropical Weather Conference. And um, look at those waves coming in. Wow, that's from Darby. The leftovers of Darby. Darby was coming through south of Hawaii, southeast of Hawaii. It was a powerful hurricane and it generated these big swells that have rolled in there, some of them causing damage. There's been lots of different videos on Twitter. You can look at the hashtag swell, Hawaii Darby, as uh, we have here with the weather boy. So just an example of impacts even when, I mean, Darby's gone. It's dissipated. It's uh, just a remnant low. But the energy that got input into the Pacific was already there. So if you throw a big rock in a pond, the rock sinks to the bottom while those big ripples still go out. And if it's a big enough pond, they just keep on going. And the rock is gone. Darby's gone. But the impacts remain a vivid example of that. And that can be dangerous. It really can. Not just in Hawaii, but along any other coastlines where these big swells come in and make big crashing waves. You can get neck and back injuries and uh, big rip current problems depending on the shape of the coastline, etc., so there you go. Appreciate uh, the weather boy posting that tweet. Glad to show it. All right, satellite animation. Not a lot going on across the deep tropics anywhere through here until you get out off the coast of Africa. We'll look at that in more detail in a moment. Gulf of Mexico, nice and clear. That'll just warm it up out there. Caribbean is very clear. I know you guys need the rain over here in the Northeast Caribbean. I've been hearing from Brent. He's like, yep, you know, we've had a few showers uh, every once in a while, but you're in a rainfall deficit down there, unfortunately. And then, of course, like I said, the deep tropics are nice and quiet. Here's a slow-moving cold front uh, coming through the eastern two-thirds of the United States, and then a big old heat dome setting up shop out here. We're going to see some record highs coming up soon in the nation's midsection, and I know there's a lot going on over in Europe and uh, the northwest part of that continent, including the UK, France, Spain, Portugal. Wow. I mean, my brother and his family live in London, and he was telling me that they're putting foil up on the windows. They don't have AC, and their houses are not insulated like we do here in North America, as an example. And so it gets really hot in there, and then the heat sticks around at night, and that's when it can be especially problematic because your core temperature isn't able to drop and so you get hyperthermic more thermic right not hypothermic where you have a, a lack of heat um, it's hyperthermia hyper hyperthermia you get warm at night there's been deaths over there it's a, it's a really big deal um, has nothing to do necessarily with the tropics except there's been this upper level low and you can see it just a little bit right here on the satellite animation and the counterclockwise rotation of that huge low out there is funneling in south to southeasterly winds and then southerly winds, depending on where you are in Europe. And that's part of that overall circulation pattern of the North Atlantic right now. So just a tiny little bit indirectly related to tropical weather. And uh, Chris, my brother, said that it feels like a dry heat. You know, it's coming off of the continent. Uh, and, you know, the eastern Atlantic is colder uh, than the west Atlantic. So you're it's like a... Uh, Mediterranean climate, literally, over there. So the air is dry, but it's hot. But, you know, they're not used to it. Uh, interesting story, and uh, we're going to experience that again here in the nation's midsection as a big old heat dome sets up shop. So just a little bit of other weather for you real quick. So I mentioned this area 
way out here in the eastern Atlantic on the satellite shot. This is also a satellite shot, but it's a different product. Total precipitable water. Look at that. That's really, I think, the most um, precipitable water we've seen so far this season. Getting up there into those pinks and purples, that's pretty remarkable. And that's a tropical wave. It's going to change the pattern out here. We're going to get more of a southwesterly flow coming in to Africa from the Atlantic. That's going to switch the uh, the temperature profile out there. There's that upper level low as well, pumping in that dry, hot air into Europe and up in here to the UK, etc. Um, all these different products you can see from satellites. It's pretty amazing. But this guy right here, this tropical wave, that's the start of this overall gradual pattern shift that I think we're going to have as we close out the month of July and get into August. And that's a lot of water in the atmosphere there. Those purples showing up, that's remarkable. Uh, precipitable water value is in excess of two to three inches. Wow, that's a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere there. All right, so this is important. I'm going to get on to some of these charts and graphs here. Uh, mostly charts, I think, or maps. Uh, the anomalies map. Now, this is interesting. We're starting to see, and I'll zoom in on it in a minute. This is the bigger picture. We're starting to see a little bit more warming right here off the coast of Africa. Uh, that little horseshoe pattern. It's broken just a little bit right there, right near the Canaries. And we'll zoom in on, in a moment. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. But it's starting to warm up again. We've got this area of cold in the subtropics. So your warmth and instability will be focused upward motion once it gets established. When we shut down this area and this stops, the upward motion is going to be focused over here. And I think we're going to just crank out storm after storm, send these systems into the Atlantic. Some will develop early. Some will develop later. They will be in the western part of the basin. They won't be able to escape. And we're going to have a very big season coming up as advertised. I know people are starting to wonder, wait a minute, weren't we supposed to have like 20 named storms or something? We've had three and they've all been kind of eh, you know. Hey, I get it. And you know, it's not that anybody's wanting them, but the forecasts were all out there. It wasn't just one person or one agency that was on a limb on their own, you know, way out here saying, yeah, I think it's going to be a big season. A lot of people, a lot of data behind these forecasts and it's coming not you know nothing's 100 percent till it happens but it's not supposed to be busy this time of the hurricane season july 18th no and then you can still have a huge season even after things normally get cranking about a month from now on a normal time scale in climatology so let's zoom in and that's what i'm talking about right there just a little bit of a break in that overall horseshoe pattern of the warm AMO look, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, that ring of anomalous warmth that comes through here, subtropics colder, you focus the energy down here, it's in place. It's not classic, it's not the best that's ever looked in terms of favorability, but it's also not cold. And this is a very different feature than last year. Look at that, an Atlantic Nina. Uh, you know, that's kind of a thing, I guess. You don't hear about it much. El Nino, La Nina, that's typically a Pacific phenomenon. But look at this, this cold area down at the equator. Last year, this was warmer. And that uh, tended to focus and pull the intertropical convergence zone farther to the south. And I think that helped to stifle the hurricane season after we got past uh, mid-September with Larry and Sam and then it just kind of abruptly shut off in October. We were bracing for this big October last year in the western part of the basin, and it was practically non-existent, a couple of rogue, smaller storms. And I think that uh, Atlantic Nino last year, the abnormal warming down here, this is the complete opposite. So that is a very interesting sign. And then just north of it, this little band right through here in the main development region, is warmer than average by about a half a degree to a degree Celsius. And that much energy spread out over that large of an area is a lot of added energy for these tropical systems to take advantage of once the atmosphere cooperates. The water temperatures are there. The atmosphere just has to get set up. Had a little bit of a warming spell here in the eastern Pacific, but overall the La Nina is still holding on fairly firmly and 
the CFS, which did a really good job, if you watch these videos, you ought to go back if you don't have anything to do and check out some of my video discussions from December and January where we showed this and it predicted uh, a lot of talk that there was going to be an El Nino this year and the CFS did a good job at showing that there would be a La Nina and here we are. So here's the CFS. It was updated today and it shows us going a little bit deeper into that La Nina state by the fall and then gradually rebounding as we get into 2023. But it does show a, a continual dip here, just a little bit more of a strengthening La Nina as we get into the heart of the hurricane season. And that's important because this water profile out here, this will cool off a little bit. So next week, when we look at this, you'll see there will be less warmth out there. All right, That La Nina is making a comeback. The Gulf, warmer than average. The Caribbean, warmer than average. Much, much warmer than average up in the northwest Atlantic. That's been there for about the last six or seven years. Just part of the overall shift in the way everything's going with the climate and the ocean circulations. And then I don't really know how in the world to explain that. Um, it certainly sticks out. Is it affecting anything? I'm sure it is, but I don't even know where to look for, like what do you call that other than a huge blob of extreme warmth tucked away there in the North Pacific, south of Hawaii, I'm sorry, south of the Aleutians, well south of the Aleutians in Alaska and north of Hawaii. Just kind of interesting there. It's in no man's land, way, way out there. I'm sure there'll be a lot of speculation in the YouTube comments. Um, and Steve, Delaware Steve's going to say that it's aliens, because it's always aliens. You never know. All right, back to task here. Um, look at that, the Gulf Wow, it's warmer than average. We know that. I showed you that. But how warm is it, right? Um, pretty darn warm. That's 30 Celsius all through here. We've lost a lot of the 31 Celsius. That's okay, right? But still, 30 C, you know, we're talking about, what, 85 degrees, 86 degrees, somewhere around that Fahrenheit. A majority of the Gulf is at least 30 Celsius. Uh, the rest of it's darn close, 29. I mean, that's getting it. And when things do come into the Gulf, there's going to be ample opportunity for very intense hurricanes there. Off of the Mid-Atlantic and elsewhere, I'm a little disappointed, I will say, that these maps are a couple of days out of date. They're always a day behind, but it should say the 17th of July. And I've even refreshed it. Now watch, it's going to update now. Um, nope, still July 16th. Anyway, um, try to get it centered back. There we go. July 16th, and what do we see? Well, water temperatures off of my coast. I'm down here in Wilmington, uh, about 28 Celsius, 29 south into South Carolina and south from there, Georgia, Florida. Uh, what about the mid-Atlantic? Uh, all the way up here from Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and up around New England. Always too cold up here, so forget about it. But they're warming up. Sea surface temperatures, 24, 25 Celsius. Um, you know, so mid to upper 70s Fahrenheit. And I say, yeah, it's still only mid-July. Once we get to the 20th and beyond, I guess we consider that late July if we divide it up into thirds um, or whatever, that uh, we still have a good month to six weeks of warming going on because the sun angle is still pretty high in the sky. It's this gradual process where the days get shorter, thank goodness, because, I mean, I like winter storms. They're interesting, that whole side of it, but... You know, I'm a summer guy, um, like that Frozen movie with the snowman fella, you know, the summer thing that he sang, whatever. That's me. I like summer. I'm all about summer. It's an interesting paradox, though, because I also enjoy a good blizzard. But, you know, it's like when you visit a city and you say, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. That's how I feel about winter sometimes. Anyhow, hang in there. Warmer water temperatures coming for your neck of the woods from, well, let's just call it Virginia Beach north towards Cape Cod. Roughly. All right, vorticity signature. This is interesting. Um, there's the vort signature out there off the coast of Africa. So a lot of energy. And again, what's that? what that's going to do, let me just go back real quick. Uh, and this is the beauty of this discussion is I can just kind of, you know, this is what I would look at. And I'm showing you what I look at, if that makes sense there. And so we can jump back and forth. So this area that's coming off now, this tropical wave is kind of winding up like that. And it's going to shift the winds here that are going to come in, and I'll show you on the GFS in a moment, more southwesterly. And then up here on the uh, north part of the wave, 
the winds are northeasterly, and it'll pull some sal off of Africa. But you're going to shift the wind pattern out here and develop this monsoon trough. Let's use like this deep blue color. This monsoon trough is going to set up right about here and shift the wind pattern around. And that's really going to warm up the water because it's going to come in from this way, the wind, at the lower parts of the atmosphere. So the trades aren't going to be screaming across here like that. And I'll show you that on the GFS. So the point is, this should have a pretty marked warming coming up between now and let's say the next 10 days. So as we revisit this next week, um, we should see some decent warming there in the eastern Atlantic. All right, where was I? Vorticity signature, nothing elsewhere in the deep tropics out here. There's Estelle. I didn't mention Estelle earlier. No disrespect to Estelle, but it's not going to be a problem for anybody out here. It could generate some swells. And as I showed you from the Weather Boy footage there, yes, swells can have an impact, so we don't want to discount that. But, you know, swells versus the direct hit of a major hurricane, I think we'll take the swells. At least you can just not go in the water. <laughs> you can avoid that entirely. All right, so this is really cool here. Um, this is what I'm talking about. There's that tropical wave. This is the GFS. Uh, that's a pretty good chunk of energy. If it was later on, a month from now, this would come off and it would develop and it would be a pretty big hurricane by the time it got out into the central Atlantic. I could almost guarantee you that. It's just a little bit dry. Overall, there's not a lot of upward motion for it, uh, but it is the start, I think, of this new pattern that we're going to gradually head towards. So let's just watch mainly this area right through here and notice and it's already started that these little wind barbs here are going to generally switch around. They're trying to come in from the east and northeast and just blow across evenly. Those are the trades south of this big old area of high pressure. But watch what this does. It's going to be really cool here. Let's put this into motion frame by frame. That rolls off. And look how far out into the Atlantic, hundreds of miles, it extends this little trough right here, this monsoon trough. Let's just start over. Northeast switching around, then they come back. You know, so we're coming in this way, northeast winds, and then uh, northerly here, and then it switches around to um, what would you say? That's west southwest to southwesterly winds, and that's just going to really slow the trades through here, warm up that part of the main development region, and then that energy goes on across, and that influence really extends out pretty far, and even where it's not switching directions. Your wind barbs here are minuscule, five, maybe ten knots of trades at 5,000 feet. You know, not 20 or 30 knots. That is really, really important. And eventually, when these tropical waves come off and they are much more vigorous, they're not going to be hauling across the Atlantic at 20 knots. They're going to be coming across 10 to 15 knots, 18 to 20 miles per hour, somewhere around there. And that will allow them to gather. They're not going to get stretched and not able to pull themselves together. That's all coming. It's a gradual process. And I think it's fascinating that we can see it begin to unfold. That's the first one that comes off. We're now out at about 108 hours. By day five, the general pattern is still light trades out there, more moisture, more humidity coming off. Day six, finally day seven, same kind of thing. Look at just the light trade winds all through here. Very, very little in the way of deep, sustained, fast trade winds. Um, not a lot of strong high pressure to the north. It shifted over to the west a little bit. Um, that's it. The pattern's starting to change. Now we're getting towards late July there. And we'll keep on going out to about day 10, if it'll let me. And uh, we'll end right there. Day 10, another one, another little sack of energy, or a pouch as they call it. And it's just a matter of time. One of these is going to take root, this energy over Africa. All of them rolling off, heading west. It's only a matter of getting to the climatological uptick naturally, and then eventually the uh, Madden-Julian oscillation, a combination of that, which is a larger scale, longer time frame of favorability, coupled with, and you ready for this one, convectively coupled Kelvin waves, these little shots, a few days in duration of favorability, higher moisture content, lower wind shear values, uh, more vorticity. It's these little areas that come across in rapid fashion that leave behind them a window of opportunity for something to develop. We're going to see a lot of that coming up 
uh, in the next few weeks, I do believe. All right, moving on to something a little different. If you followed my work, you know, uh, A, thanks to our crowdfunding, these last few years have been able to greatly expand beyond just hurricanes. Hurricanes, all roads lead to the hurricanes. That's what I did. That's why I got the shirt. It's what this new office that I'm working on. And by the way, we're going to change the view to this way. Uh, you'll see on August 1st, a whole new look. You can just barely see a part of the set there. Got a new office setting and everything. It's going to be nice. Um, but anyway, all of that, I'm hurricane focused, but I am a weather geek, a geographer, an earth scientist, all wrapped up into one. I like other interesting weather. And now, thanks to our Patreon, especially since 2016 to now, I've been able to expand and travel to cover other weather. Severe weather in the spring, the monsoon I'm getting ready to talk about here, nor'easters, blizzards, lake effect snows, that kind of thing. Um, and it's just really amazing. So that being said, Thursday I'm flying out to Phoenix where I will join up with one of our crowdfunding partners, Matt from Denver, um, specifically the Parker area of Colorado. He actually hosts one of our cams out there. And he and I are going to spend six days all around Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and um, we're going to document the monsoon, try to capture some interesting things, um, maybe stream live when we can. There's a lot of remote area out there, so some of it's going to be use the GoPros, capture what you can, and then come show everybody the next day because, uh, you know, there's not Verizon everywhere. There's plenty of desert out there where there's no Verizon signal. Um, and we don't have Starlink yet, so... Mr. Musk, uh, if you're watching, I, I could use a Starlink. We'd love to test it for you during hurricanes. Um, all kidding aside, I am heading out there for that. I'm fascinated by it. It's an amazing phenomenon. It changes the landscape, so stay tuned to that. That's coming up. Uh, I'll talk more about it. Um, probably Thursday, once I'm out there, I get there many, many hours ahead of Matt, and I'll do an update from Phoenix on Thursday, all right? All right, uh, this is what it looks like, by the way, and that moisture there, this is Arizona down here, uh, right there. There's Arizona, there's New Mexico. Finally going to get to meet Eric, meet Eric Webb, if I can speak. Uh, you know, Webb, Weber Weather, Eric Webb, he is working for the government, I think it is, in Albuquerque. It's roughly where Albuquerque is. And we're going to figure out how, when, and where to meet sometime around there. I'll meet with Jeremy Smith, a uh, friend of mine, who was actually in our episode about the desert southwest from the Hurricane Highway. I think it's episode four of season two. And uh, he works down for the government as well in Sierra Vista. I'm going to go over to Las Vegas and meet with a colleague there. I'm going to do some reporting and some storytelling about Lake Mead. That whole big disaster that's unfolding there as the lake drops towards what they call Deadpool. And no, that's not a... Anyway, it's not just a movie from Marvel that's rated R. This is a real phenomenon, and if it reaches Deadpool level, that could be a real problem. But the big spectacle, of course, is all that moisture out there. It comes around the backside of the high, and if the high is positioned just right, you get that southeasterly flow to southerly flow, and you get evapotranspiration moisture coming out of the deep forests of Mexico. Yes, there are lots of forests down in Mexico, not just desert. The Sonoran Desert is there, but there's also this moisture that comes out of these forests, that gets transported north, moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, moisture from the Pacific. It gets channeled into the southwest, and magic ensues. It's really incredible, and this is what it looks like going out till about the 25th or 23rd or something like that. 25th, there it is. So I'm excited. I'm ready to do it. All right, a couple other things to point out for you if I can get my Telestrator to cooperate. Maybe I'm not going to be able to. There we go. Uh, off the website here, click on Hurricane Track Store. CJ did a great job. Several of you on uh, our Discord channel have been posting pictures of the merch that you have purchased. I've always been kind of humble about this. Like, I, I don't push it hard enough. I just, I don't know. i got to get over that. People want it. I appreciate it. And i got to learn to, there's a good balance there, right? Uh, but we do. We have a store. Um, our back-end partner, CJ, set all this up for me. He's, he's done a lot of work in uh, an, another related um, store. Well, like in his work in South Florida is what I'm trying to say. He's got experience with it. If I can just untie my tongue and get my brain to function. So he knew what he was doing as the bottom line. There's lots of stuff on here. I'll put a uh, link 
in the description. We have our own official merch store. Um, you know, it's like what the other big YouTubers use, right? It's, and Spring does a great job. I've ordered a couple of items myself, and they get here in just a few days. We were using a different company. I won't mention who because I don't want to besmirch anyone, but it always took like two weeks. And these products come in just a few days, and I really like the feel of the T-shirts. Uh, spring, Teespring, it used to be called now just Spring, I think. Two thumbs up. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm endorsing it, and, and they're not paying me to say that. Um, you know, we get a cut of it, obviously, as a fundraiser, but I really like what they've done so far. So check it out if you want to get a coffee mug or a shirt or a hoodie for next winter. People wonder why you wear a, wondering why you are wearing a Hurricane Track hoodie when it's 12 degrees outside. All right. What else did I want to show you? Uh, yeah, we're on Patreon. I mentioned that. And I'm going to push it more because we're heading into the peak part of the season. And this is where we put everything. The live cams, our Discord. Um, and Discord is absolutely awesome. You get the whole ball of wax for just $10 a month. Look at that. All these different access points you get. And you help support what we're doing. And you can do more. $25 a month. You get your name in the credits of future documentary works. You can even be a producer if you want to. And it'll say, produced by so-and-so. And, -so. and um, we haven't had any business patrons just yet. But that's still out there. If you have a business that you want me to promote. You know, i got to follow the, um, what is it, the some kind of guidelines. Like if it was the Acme... Uh, generator company, I would have to say that on the YouTube. Um, is it Federal Trade Commission FTC guidelines? That's fine. I'd be glad to conform if we get a business patron that supports what we're doing. But visit us at patreon.com slash hurricane track or just get the Patreon app and search hurricane track. That's where all the live feeds go. Um, it is really something else and that is how we fund what we do. And at the very least, Consider subscribing to the channel and sharing these videos with your friends and family. Um, CJ puts these on Facebook as well, so follow us there. Whatever, whatever works for you. I just, I'm, I'm glad you're tuning in. Without you, there's no reason to be me, and to be me, I guess, or to do it. That's funny. Without you, there's no reason to be me. You know what I'm saying? And without you, why would I want to do this? Because I would just be talking to nobody. But that's not the case. I've got you out there, and I do appreciate it more than you know. We will be ready for when the hurricane season turns on, and uh, we have more capability than ever before. And a large part of that is because of you all on the other side of the screen. One way or the other, you're supporting this, even if you're just watching the video and sharing it with those who you want to educate as well. All right, that is it from me for today. I will do this again on Thursday from Phoenix. Between now and then, I will do the What's Up in the Tropics. The one Thursday morning is going to be really early. I'll probably schedule it to be posted so you don't get a notification at 6.15 in the morning. My flight's like at 7-something. So anyhow, I'll do that, and then I'll get a, do another update out in Phoenix later on Thursday afternoon. All right? All right, that's it for me. Like I said, I am Mark Sutter. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you this way again from Phoenix, Arizona on Thursday afternoon.